I'm really happy to be here this morning to talk about memory-driven computing, which is a new architecture that we've been working on at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. Uh, it combines persistent memory as well as fast memory semantic uh, interconnects to hopefully solve uh, the, the kinds of data intensive application challenges that we're facing today. So where are we? We're in a world where by the year 2020, there will be 8 billion people. And those 8 billion people will have about 20 billion connected devices, so mobile devices, um, as well as 100 billion infrastructure devices, so smart sensors and things like that. And all told, this combination of, of people and devices are going to be generating upwards of 44 zettabytes of information, of data. How many people know what a zettabyte is? Okay. A handful, very good. So I've, many people aren't familiar with, with what the zettabyte uh, prefix means. So it's basically a billion terabytes. So considerable amount of data that will be generated on an annual basis uh, by the year 2020. Uh, and so it's not so much the, the huge data deluge that we're facing, but it's also about how we want to use this data uh, to create better insights. And so increasingly what we're finding is that the value of data is really tied to how quickly we can process it and to extract that important information from the data uh, so that we can actually make decisions on that. And in particular, we're moving from a world where uh, in the past we've had uh, sort of a system of record, essentially. Uh, and so the idea here was that our digital world was really a reflection of our physical world when we were trying to capture human transactions, so things like banking transactions and whatnot. And the idea for systems of record is that they were focused mostly on structured data to be able to create accurate and, uh, and traceable kinds of, of transaction records uh, in order to, to keep track of things that, that people were doing in the real world. So very, very kind of longer latencies if you think of, you know, in terms of the, the kinds of, of response times that we were looking for. Today we're moving more towards a world where we're talking about systems of engagement, systems that allow people to interact with one another. So think about social media applications. And the, the focus here is slightly different. The focus is more on unstructured data. So I want to be able to upload the, the vacation photos from my latest vacation and share that with my social circle. And so we were looking really more for interactive kinds of performance, um, but complete accuracy isn't required. Um, as we heard yesterday, there are eventually consistent models that are being applied in many of these systems, and so it's possible to see updates out of order, but in these kinds of applications, that's generally okay. In the future, we're going to be moving more towards a world where the systems are for action, uh, to, be able to allow both people as well as machines to be able to interact with one another and to make decisions. And so an example of that is you know, smart or, or autonomous vehicles. Uh, and so there, the, we're really combining the requirements of the previous two types of systems. So we want to be able to interact with structured and unstructured data. But we also need to be able to, to do that in a very fast way. So near, near real time, low latencies are required for making these kinds of decisions in these automated environments. And we also need to be able to make accurate decisions. It would be bad if the car decided to turn left when it really needed to turn right. So we need the combination of all these different kinds of requirements, which are a lot more demanding than, than things have been in the past. Now, unfortunately, traditional computing architectures really aren't keeping up. And so here we see a number of different trends that you probably are all familiar with. So things like Moore's Law talking about transistor density, uh, as well as single-threaded processor performance, clock frequencies, uh, typical power consumptions of processors, as well as even the number of cores that a typical processor has. Uh, so lots of data represented on this slide, but the, the upshot of it all is that most of these trends are starting to level out as early as the year 2015. And so you know, future microprocessor improvements are really going to be limited by the sunset of, of you know, Moore's Law and, and Denard scaling and whatnot. And so we're, we're starting to see limitations on these traditional architectures. Uh, it's not just compute, so the memory uh, system is also having a hard time keeping up. In fact, it's having a harder time keeping up. So this is data that, uh, that John McAlpin presented at supercomputing last fall. And so what he, would look, what he was looking at was the balance between flops, so floating point performance, and memory system performance. And so the, the y-axis is a log scale, um, and it shows the ratio between flops and memory performance of a variety of different sorts. So all told, if memory performance is tracking processor performance, then the line, the trend line should be horizontal. And as you can see, nowhere near horizontal, and you know, really nowhere near horizontal because of the log scale on the y-axis. And so what we see is, so, so blue is the, the sustained memory bandwidth. Um, and so that's growing, that, that gap really is growing at about 14% every year. 
Uh, similarly, the, the memory latency gap is growing even worse. And so there, that's growing at about 24% per year. And so processors are really becoming increasingly uh, imbalanced with respect to doing data-intensive kinds of operations. This is all just for a single node. As we start to put, uh, put nodes together in order to scale out our systems, we find that our coordination is really limited by our ability to communicate data back and forth between those nodes. And so typically we use you know, various forms of explicit message passing in order to share data, which involves copying data from one node to another. Um, and so there are a lot of overheads that are involved with that. And so what we've been looking at is to, to look at really inverting this architecture and bringing the memory into the sort of the focal point of the architecture. And this memory-driven architecture, we believe, will be, allow us to better able, uh, be better able to actually capture the requirements and to address the requirements of data-intensive applications as we move forward. The main four pillars, if you will, of, of memory-driven computing are fast persistent memory, uh, as well as fast memory interconnects, and uh, task-specific processing, uh, as well as new software stacks that allow us to take advantage of, of these uh, architectural trends. Um, now, I'm not gonna spend very much time talking about the task-specific processing, but that the basic idea there is that we wanna be able to tailor the processing capabilities to the needs of the application. So most of this talk will really focus more on, on the memory system and memory slash storage system um, as we get into it. So the outline for the talk is first we'll look at what are the technology trends that are motivating this particular form of memory-driven computing architecture. And then I'll talk about highlights from, uh, from our experiences with how memory-driven computing can benefit applications. So we've got some initial insights based on the work that we've been doing. We also have some ideas for how memory-driven computing might benefit uh, high-performance computing applications as well. Um, then we'll talk about how we actually get from these research ideas to memory-driven computing and some of the work specifically that we've been doing in data management and programming models um, that we've been open sourcing uh, to share with the community. Um, and then finally, if there's time, we'll think of uh, some challenges that we believe that memory-driven computing poses for this community. And then we'll summarize. All right, what brings us to this memory-driven computing architecture? Well, a number of things. Uh, first and foremost are really new additions to the memory and storage hierarchy. So here we see the traditional memory and storage hierarchy with capacity on the x-axis and access latencies on the y-axis. And there are two notable new additions uh, to this traditional hierarchy. Um, in particular, high bandwidth memory that is often co-packaged or, or stacked um, that's nestled in between the, the caches of a processor as well as the, the per node uh, DDR-based DRAM. So that high bandwidth memory really does provide a very high bandwidth path uh, to a small amount of memory um, and at also at very low latency. Um, so that's an important component of, of application design as we, as we move forward. The other main class um, and really the focus of a lot of the work that we've been doing is non-volatile memory technologies, um, what some people call storage class memory. And there are a number of different technologies that provide us with non-volatile memory capabilities. Um, so it could be spin transfer torque, uh, MRAM, resistive RAM, phase change memory, and so on. Um, there are lots of different flavors. What's, what's important here is not so much the different flavors, but the common properties that they all provide. Um, and namely, that, that we have the ability to persistently store data. So once we take away the power, this memory will actually remember the state that's being stored there. Um, unlike storage devices, which traditionally take a very long time to access, these devices can be accessed in times that look more like memory speeds. Um, so there's this opportunity for memory speed persistence, which is very exciting. Um, because the latencies are so low, we can think about accessing things in relatively small granularities, so byte addressability or cache line addressability through memory-based loads and store operations. Um, we, we do that instead of having to actually amortize the cost of, of accessing a slow storage device by making a system call and doing a read or write operation to a slow storage device. Now, because these, uh, these technologies don't need to be refreshed the way that DRAM does, they can actually be much more energy efficient than DRAM. Um, and in addition, because many of their architectures really involve 3D kinds of topologies, um, they're actually uh, potentially much more dense than DRAM as well. Uh, so they provide a lot of really interesting properties that we want to be able to exploit in these architectures as we move forward. On the interconnect front, there have also been interesting uh, new advances uh, ac across sort of the different levels, uh, layers of the stack. 
So if we start at the, at the physical layer, um, thinking about transceiver assembly kinds of architectures, this is not something that I think about on a regular basis, but I have a number of colleagues uh, at labs that have been thinking quite a bit about this topic. And in particular, um, some of the work that they've been doing looks at a technology called VIXELs, or vertical cavity surface emitting lasers. And so the basic idea there is that we have, we have an opportunity to actually simplify the way that we can calibrate the, the transceiver assembly uh, to be able to do this in a, in a more automated fashion. Um, and we combine that with you know, some, some coarse division, wave division multiplexing technologies, and we can actually increase the amount of bandwidth that's brought, um, not just from the wide area, but also really into the system uh, design as, uh, as, uh, in, in sort of the, the closer form factor. So in particular, the, the uh, the photonics folks talk about the number of colors that you can get in a fiber. And so a traditional, uh, you know, sort of if we have, think about, about just a single mode uh, or a single color in a fiber, that's about 25 gigabit, 25 uh, sort of gigabits per second. Um, with the, the, the wave division multiplexing, we can actually have multiple colors or multiple modes within a single fiber, getting us up to as much as 100 gigabits per second for the fiber. If we couple then together multiple fibers, we can see upwards of uh, about a terabit per second of bandwidth through that bundle. So opportunities for really huge amounts of bandwidth that we can bring into the system. And we can do this all at relatively low power um, as well as low cost, again, because of this you know, more, of a, more automated way of calibrating the, the assembly. Doesn't just stop at the at the physical layer. We can also think about the the overall topology that we use for these interconnects, um, and a variety of different uh, advances in, in switch design um, are, are allowing us to have very high rate switches, so upwards of maybe even 64 ports on a given switch. Um, and what that allows us to do is to assemble topologies that have a relatively small diameter, so small number of hops to get from one side of that interconnect to the other side of the interconnect. So this has really interesting implications uh, for what the latencies are to access data um, from, from a processor to a, a disaggregated memory pool. Um, also for allowing processors to communicate with one another in terms of the number of hops that those messages actually have to traverse. This is at the lower levels, if, if we start thinking then about the protocols that are run on top of these interconnects, um, there have been also some interesting new developments in that, uh, on that front as well. Some of you may be familiar with the Gen Z Consortium, which was founded uh, last fall. Um, this is a, a consortium of about 35 companies um, across a, a wide spectrum of different disciplines um, that have gotten together to propose an open systems interconnect standard. And so the idea is, you know, these are companies that are memory manufacturers, uh, storage and networking device manufacturers, system integrators, processor vendors, and so on. So really across the, across the spectrum of different types of technologies. And they've all gotten together to propose this open, open standard, um, you know, based on some of the technology trends that they see. So emerging storage class memory operation, uh, storage class memory technologies, as well as really a demand for being able to independently scale the memory portion of the system from the processing portion of the system. So really giving the opportunity to provide that this disaggregated or pooled memory. And so what, what the Gen Z uh, protocols allow you to do are really to allow processing elements to talk to that disaggregated memory, as well as to talk to storage uh, and I.O. devices, uh, storage and networking I.O. devices, um, as well as to even talk to each other. So think about general purpose processors talking with accelerators. Um, and all of this will be done with memory semantics. So load and store types of operations or put and get types of operations um, with providing functionality for doing atomic operations. So things like compare and swap so that you can actually coordinate between these different elements better. And we expect that to see you know, upwards of hundreds of gigabytes of bandwidth per second uh, possible on uh, here, uh, and uh, as well as sub-microsecond latencies um, from one edge of the fabric to another edge of the fabric. Uh, it's possible to, to come up with a, a wide range of different topologies here, both direct attached as well as you know, switched topologies or even more general fabric topologies here. And so we expect to see that sub-microsecond load to use latencies um, for even the more general topologies that you see here. And if you're interested in learning more about Gen Z, there's a draft specification that's available for download from the website. I encourage you to take a look, although it's, it's nice light bedtime reading. It's a, it's a several hundred page long document, uh, but there are lots of really interesting details there. On the compute side, um, we are starting to see trends for you know, dark silicon effects. Um, and so increasingly, processor design is really limited more by the power that's going to be consumed uh, than it is by the area that will be consumed. 
And so as a result, uh, a lot of new microprocessor designs are really looking more at a combination of different functional blocks, both the programmable types of, of logic as well as fixed function logic. So things like uh, ASICs or you know, even you know, GPUs, FPGAs, that kind of accelerator technology um, in order to selectively turn on and off different parts of the functionality uh, to better meet the application's specific requirements. And by doing this you know, selective enablement of different portions of, uh, you know, of the space, we're able to actually see much higher energy energy efficiency. So this is another trend that's contributing to, uh, to the space that we're looking at. So putting this all together, um, what is memory-driven computing? Memory-driven computing is a new architecture uh, that allows us to address, uh, take advantage of these technology trends to address the, the concerns and the needs of data-intensive applications. Um, and so again, a number of the different technology trends, just to summarize, um, we're seeing the non-volatile memory, which is allowing a convergence between the memory and the storage traditional hierarchy. Um, and so that's, that's gonna really sort of blur the line between memory and storage. Because of the in, uh, advances in the interconnects, we're seeing that these, this non-volatile memory will likely be organized as a disaggregated resource, really basically a high capacity uh, pool uh, or tier of memory that can be accessed uh, directly by all of the different compute resources in the system. And these low diameter networks are really gonna provide us the ability to access it at near uniform low latency. We also have our distributed uh, heterogeneous uh, computing resources, um, as we mentioned on the previous slide. It's not to mention, so the, the, the high capacity tier of memory doesn't mean that storage, uh, that the locality doesn't matter. Um, we also expect to see this local high bandwidth memory that's coupled with the processor to provide a high performance tier to complement the high capacity tier that the shared memory provides. So to a software writer, what does this look like? It looks like memory speed persistence um, and, and the ability for the processing elements to directly access the memory in that high capacity tier. They don't have to talk to any other node in order to do this. So they can do it in an unmediated fashion, uh, which is nice for the, the sort of the independent scalability of, of the system. And then finally, at the scales that we're talking about, um, another, another important component from a software perspective is that um, the, the kind of scale that we're talking about doesn't really allow us to have hardware-based cache coherence enforced uh, in the system. We'll see coherence within the context of a single SOC, but between those SOCs, we'll have to manage that um, in, in a combination of, of different software layers. If we try and put this in the context of other, uh, other models that we are familiar with, um, on the left, we see the traditional shared, mem shared nothing or, or scale out kind of an architecture. So these are the, the white box clusters that we're familiar with. Um, on the right hand side, we see shared everything. So these are the, the large memory scale up kinds of architectures, um, uh, shared memory multiprocessors that we see. Memory driven computing really presents uh, a nice combination of those, of those architectures. So, you know, named very creatively shared something because it's somewhere in between shared nothing and shared everything. Um, but the basic idea is that it, it borrows from the, you know, the shared memory pool aspects of the shared everything architecture, um, but borrows from the highly, highly scalable um, ability to, to scale the compute side from the shared nothing architecture. Um, and we can independently scale those, which is a nice, uh, nice characteristic of the shared something architecture. Memory-driven computing provides a wonderful set of opportunities for applications um, that derive mainly from the, the sort of the three high-level properties of a memory-driven computing architecture. Uh, the fact that the memory is shared, it's large, and it's persistent. And so in particular, because memory is shared, it means that we don't have to send messages anymore to actually communicate. We can just communicate through the shared memory pool. Um, we also don't have to worry about carefully partitioning data sets between the nodes of a cluster. We can actually have all nodes be able to easily access the entire data set. Because memory is large, you know, we can think about actually creating some in-memory indices that will allow us to avoid having to go to much slower storage tiers. Um, similarly, we can think about even you know, pre-computing or memoizing uh, initial results of analyses of, uh, that we want to be able to come back to later on and, and look up the, the result that we've already calculated. That can be very helpful for, for uh, latency-sensitive applications. Because memory is persistent, we really don't have to worry about the traditional storage overheads um, that we see um, with traditional storage stacks as well as devices. Um, also, for, for applications that are, are having large working sets in memory, um, we don't necessarily have to think about recalculating that in-memory data set um, should the power go away. We still have it there because the memory is persistent. Um, and then finally, obviously, and, and, and most uh, perhaps interesting to the, the HPC community is that we can do very, very fast checkpointing of a large amount of application state. 
And so we've been exploring some of these different uh, strategies, shall we say, for, for our architecting applications. And I want to give you highlights from some of the initial work that we've done in this space. So our first case study that we looked at um, uh, that I want to talk about today um, is really looking at adapting Apache Spark uh, to a large memory environment. Uh, Apache Spark is uh, a, a, a sort of a fairly popular data analytics framework that's, that's um, been originally designed for a, a scale-out clustered environment. Um, and so in that environment, the, the basic kinds of computations that are supported are a combination of local computation as well as then communication between the nodes in the cluster um, through data shuffle operations that are implemented over, uh, by sending messages over traditional networking stacks and, and networks. And so um, that's not necessary in a shared memory world. Uh, and, you know, in, in the shared memory world, you could actually have use the memory itself as the communication medium. Uh, and so a, you could declare a, a buffer space in that shared memory. Producers would produce data into the shared memory buffer, then send a reference to the consumer, which could then read the, the results directly. And so you know, by using the, the memory to communicate, we can eliminate a lot of overheads due to data copying, due to network protocol processing, even due to serialization and, and deserialization of the data itself. So there's some tremendous opportunities there just for the, the, the purpose of communicating through shared memory. We also looked at how one could manage the data sets uh, that are generated by Apache Spark. Um, and in particular, the, 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 the data sets for Spark are called uh, Resilient Distributed Data Sets, or RDDs. And they're immutable, they're generated, and then, uh, and then once they're written, they're, they're, not, they're not written again. They're, they're, they're read-only at that point. So this is interesting in an iterative environment where RDDs are produced at the end of each iteration. Um, uh, Spark is, is actually written in Scala, which is a managed language, and so it's based on the JVM uh, to, to do garbage collection and whatnot. So when you're generating lots of RDDs um, in, in multiple iterations in these iterative kinds of applications, you create a lot of memory pressure on that JVM um, and its, its ability to do garbage collection and to manage the data sets that are actually being managed on heap. And so if instead we think about allocating those data structures off heap and explicitly managing their, you know, their, their lifetime and their reclamation um, ourselves, then we have an opportunity to, to relieve some of that memory pressure um, and then also to have more control over how the data sets are being cached and when they're being reclaimed. So we've, we've adapted a version of, of Spark as well as, uh, as the graphics, uh, graphics library, or graph processing library that sits on top of Spark uh, to take advantage of some of those ideas. Um, and we, we use this modified version of GraphX to compare against an unmodified version of GraphX and Spark running in large memory environments. And so in particular, our experiments were done on, on uh, HPE's uh, Superdome X server. This particular one was configured with 12 terabytes of DRAM and 240 uh, processing cores. And what you see is a couple of different data set uh, experiments here. The first data set is a web graph circa 2012 um, that has 100 million edges and about 2 billion, uh, excuse me, 100 million nodes and about 2 billion edges. And so what you see is that the, the Spark for the machine or the, uh, the, the, the large memory adapted version of Spark um, has about 15x better performance than the, the vanilla version of Spark running in this large memory environment. Um, so that's, that's considerable. A second data set we started to scale up then uh, and, and look at a, a, a synthetically generated graph that was you know, an order of magnitude bigger, so about 2 billion nodes um, and, and about 11 billion edges. And interestingly there, uh, the traditional unmodified version of Spark doesn't even complete the processing for this predictive analytics uh, application. Um, and so as a result, you know, we, we feel like this is, this is a very positive, positive proof point for how a large memory, large persistent shared memory environment can actually benefit data analytics kinds of applications, both for improving the performance as well as for increasing the scale of the, the workloads that you can look at. A second case study is really looking at uh, extreme similarity search um, in, in a large memory environment, a large persistent memory environment. And so here, the, the basic problem statement is that we want to be able to search for items that are similar to one another. So for example, think of an image search or being able to, to think of a fraud detection in an e-commerce kind of an environment. The best uh, algorithms for doing this today really will extract a feature vector of maybe you know, hundreds of, of different features or even thousands of different features um, from each of the, the, the items in the collection. Um, and then uh, in order to answer questions about that, you would do a linear scan through the feature vector to find the ones that best match the, the, the query, if you will. 
Unfortunately, if you have a really large collection of data, uh, doing that linear scan actually is, is too slow. You won't be able to answer the question in, in, a, in a relatively interactive kind of a speed. If we have memory-driven computing in, in the large memory environment there, we have an opportunity to, to rethink how we actually structure this computation. In particular, we can take advantage of a technique called locality-sensitive hashing, uh, it, which builds very, very large sets of indices by uh, applying a, co a collection of different hash functions um, in order to be able to satisfy this similarity search question. Now, in this case, the, you know, the size of the index really depends on how many items are being indexed as well as the, you know, the desired accuracy that you have. Um, and so, so as a result, uh, you know, a, a small data set can result in a very, very large index. So this really only makes sense in very large memory environments. Uh, we looked at this by, uh, by trying to, to take large collections, um, we'll partition the data set so that we can build somewhat smaller indexes, but we'll, we'll build these per partition indexes and then search the indexes in parallel, uh, and then aggregate the results together. And we compared that basic approach um, with a couple of different platforms. One was just storing the images on, on disk and accessing them through Hadoop. Um, and then there was also an in-memory representation or in-memory algorithm that, that calculated that, that feature vector and then did the linear scan. You can see those results here. So problem size um, is on the x-axis, so ranging from 80 million images up to 800 million images. Um, and then on the, on the y-axis is the response time in milliseconds. And again, it's a log scale, so small differences on the graph are really large differences uh, in the real world. And so what we see is that this you know, simulated uh, memory-driven computing approach really allows us to achieve orders of magnitude better performance than, than the alternatives. And these results have actually been, uh, been written up in a tech report if you're interested in, uh, in more information. A third case study is looking at large-scale graph inference. Um, and in particular, you know, the hope of, of being able to compute probabilities for all of the nodes in a graph when the input data set only has probabilities for a subset of those, uh, of those nodes. Um, and this is something that would be used in security-based applications for doing malware detection or potentially even for understanding a customer behavior in an online advertising kind of an environment. Uh, the example that's shown here on the right-hand side of the slide is really one where we're trying to understand, you know, what's the, is, is a particular site um, a, a, a malicious site or not? So on the left-hand side, we have hosts that are trying to look up a particular domain. On the right-hand side, the domain itself. Um, and then the state that's associated with this is really whether the site is malicious or not. Edges represent the, those lookups. And the basic idea um, of these algorithms, many of the algorithms that have been defined are probabilistic ones that, that iterate until they, until they can actually calculate what, the, uh, what the, the probabilities are that are associated with the nodes. So we start, if you think about this in a vertex-centric way, you know, for each vertex in the, in the graph, we'll look at all the neighbors and what their probabilities are. We'll calculate the, the new probability for this node and then update the state that's associated with that node. Um, and the challenges in these kinds of algorithms really are that, um, that, that, that sort of neighbor search oftentimes results in very random, uh, random data access patterns. Um, and then in addition, because we're doing this on an iterative basis, um, there's usually a lock that's used to, to create a barrier between each of the different iterations. So there's, there's a lot of uh, coordination overhead that's resulting from, you know, from that basic structure of the computation. That's really if, it, if it's just running on a single node. If it then gets distributed in the network, then we also see coordination overheads that, you know, that are, are manifested through messaging overheads in this distributed environment. So there's an opportunity, again, to, to take advantage of the memory-driven computing architecture to do a bit better. Um, you, we can organize the, the search for neighbor uh, data by, by recognizing that that's effectively a nested loop and treat it more like a, a database join algorithm that really then can sequentially look through the data. So that's the first observation. Second observation is that this is a probabilistic algorithm, and so uh, there's been recent work that shows that for certain classes of probabilistic algorithms, it's possible for those algorithms to converge even if you don't always have access to the most up-to-date data. So we take advantage of that to take away the locks and still have the, the algorithm converge. And then finally, rather than sending messages back and forth between the different nodes, we'll actually take advantage of a, of a globally available and visible data, uh, data structure that's actually uh, being updated as the, the, the probabilities are, up, uh, are recalculated in each iteration. And so again, we looked at that, at, at that particular algorithm on the, on the, the, the Superdome X um, and compared that with a, a, another popular graph framework uh, called GraphLab. And what we see there is that you know, these approaches for, for, um, for 
making more memory-centric kinds of, um, of, of accesses rather than message-centric accesses, and then also removing some of the coordination overheads uh, allow us to achieve two orders of magnitude improvement in the performance of, you know, of these kinds of, of inference applications. And again, this is written up in a tech report if you're interested in more details. A final proof point is really looking at, uh, at simulation, and this is a topic that I think pretty much every discipline is, is interested in the ability to do faster simulations. Um, in particular, we've been looking at Monte Carlo simulation in the context of financial applications. Um, and so the basic idea for Monte Carlo simulation is that you have a model um, that has some parameterization um, that, you, that you want to be able to then look at. You iteratively then generate a set of random inputs to that and then calculate the output of the model and then repeat until you actually have converged or answered the question with sufficient levels of accuracy. Um, in a memory-driven computing world, we can take this, this iterative kind of uh, simulation exercise, which will take a long time to come up with an answer. We can turn that long latency operation into something where we, we sort of change the space-time trade-offs and we can pre-calculate a bunch of, of uh, um, representative simulations and then store those results in the large memory environment so that later on when we're asked a question, we can come back and actually then just use transformations on the already computed uh, simulation results in order to achieve an answer in a much smaller time. And so we, you know, we've looked at this to do you know, a couple of different kinds of financial modeling questions. Option pricing is how much should I pay today in order to be able to sell a, a, a resource in the future at a fixed price. Uh, value at risk is really looking at you know, if I have a portfolio of, of investments, you know, how will I estimate what that's going to be worth in a certain amount of time. And so what we see is that you know, this memory-driven computing approach where we're you know, pre-calculating things and, and turning things into lookups um, really allows us to achieve multiple orders of magnitude better performance than a traditional simulation. <clears throat> Excuse me. So those are just a handful of examples of how we've explored memory-driven computing in the context of a variety of different applications. Um, the, the amount of benefit that one sees is kind of proportional to the amount of effort that one puts into redesigning the algorithm. So you can look at existing frameworks and still see order, you know, an order of magnitude of performance. If you're willing to completely rethink things, you can see multiple orders of magnitude of performance improvement um, in, uh, in, in the, 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 the behavior that, that memory-driven computing can offer to these applications. How might memory-driven computing benefit HPC types of applications? Well, a lot of similar ideas, you know, uh, appear here. Because memory is shared, one can imagine doing communication through memory. So again, you think of in-memory collective operations. I've also heard a number of people talk about um, the, the, the difficulties of, of having large amounts of data that, we then, that they then need to read. Um, and so because they have metadata scalability issues, they'll want to cache a copy of that, that read-only data in their local high bandwidth memory. Well, unfortunately, high bandwidth memory is a very scarce resource, so that's not necessarily the best use of that. So in a memory-driven computing world, you could actually have a single copy of that read-only data that's stored in your, uh, in your fabric-attached memory. Finally, you can also think about doing you know, in-situ data analytics or even computational steering where you're changing the parameterization of a simulation as you go, just because this memory is shared between the different nodes. Because memory is large, we can think about you know, using it to do a number of different simultaneous experiments. So think about uncertainty quantification or you know, simultaneously exploring different parameterizations um, of, of, a, of an experiment, or even memoizing the, 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 temp the intermediate analyses that we see. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, checkpointing can be dramatically sped up um, as a result of having, uh, having this uh, memory-driven computing architecture. Um, and we also wouldn't have to worry about explicitly loading data from storage and worrying about the serialization overheads. Um, and then finally, there's an opportunity for doing much faster visualization um, and verification operations on those simulation results. Okay, how do we actually get to this memory-driven computing architecture um, from these research ideas and initial proof points? We've been doing an, a, a, a work across the entire stack, um, and we've had some interesting sort of recent results that we can report. Um, just yesterday, so hot off the presses, um, we were able to demonstrate um, a cluster of, of 160 terabytes of fabric-attached memory being accessed by 40 nodes. Um, and so, and, and running on top of that is a software stack that includes an optimized version of Linux as well as other kinds of applications. Um, so it's, we've been able to actually demonstrate both the hardware design, hardware implementation, uh, as well as, as various levels of the software stack. And I'll tell you a little bit more about, about some of the software layers um, as, we, as we go throughout the rest of the talk. <clears throat> 
So this is just a picture of some of the hardware that we've built. Um, what you see is really a combination of two different boards. So on the, on the left-hand side, we see the fabric attached memory um, with its you know, fabric attached memory, the, the DIMMs. So in this, in this particular prototype, the, the role of fabric attached memory is being played by DRAM, um, just because that's what we could get in, in large quantities. So we have fabric attached memory as well as a fabric attached memory controller that you see there pointed out on the slide. On the right-hand side is more the compute-centric uh, part of the, of the node. And so we see uh, both the compute SOC as well as that local private memory um, and then the fabric bridge that allows the node to talk uh, to the rest of the, of the fabric. And for now, uh, in, our, in our initial prototype, most of the, the logic for the, the controllers and the bridge have been implemented in FPGAs to allow us to explore different, uh, you know, different aspects of the protocol. Um, but you can imagine that ultimately that would be, uh, be implemented in an ASIC. So this is a logical representation of, of that architecture. And so each of the, the gray boxes corresponds to the, the picture that we just saw. Um, and so the basic idea here is that the fabric attached memory in each of these, you know, these two board enclosures um, really allows us to, to create this logically shared pool of fabric attached memory that's accessible by any of the different compute nodes. So what that means is that you know, any SOC can talk to any part of the shared fabric attached memory. Uh, it doesn't matter if the SOC that corresponds, you know, that is co-packaged with that memory goes away. Um, even if that's true, then the, the memory, the fabric attached memory that's there is still a, a, is visible by all of the other nodes in the system. And we do this um, for, for purposes of fault tolerance. So we are separately powering the compute uh, center versus the, the fabric attached memory so that we can provide that, that fault independence of compute and, and memory. This architecture gives us the opportunity to really rethink the way that we write software uh, throughout all levels of the stack. Um, and I want to tell you a little bit about some of the work that we've been doing in the operating system space as well as the data management and programming framework space. Um, I should say that the work that we've been doing here really does form two different kinds of paths. So one is to use familiar APIs and systems and then adapt them to provide better performance and, uh, and, and to take advantage of the, the memory-driven computing architecture. Another path is really to rethink the APIs and the, and the abstractions entirely. Um, and so we've got examples of both of those in the work that we've been doing. So one example of, of the take the existing APIs and, and, uh, and make them adapt to, uh, to our world is the work that we've been doing on what we call Linux for the machine. So this is really, it's a combination of different things. Um, first of all, it's an adaptation of the Linux kernel uh, to be able to support fabric attached persistent memory and to be able to talk across that, that fabric in order to access that memory. It also includes a couple of libraries, um, in particular libraries to provide the atomic primitives that allow coordination between the different nodes um, and, and to allow sharing across those nodes. It also includes modifications to the PMMIO library um, that was originated at, at Intel uh, to support non-coherent access. So to invalidate cache lines um, and to flush the cache lines as, ne as needed in order to allow the nodes to, to, um, to share in this non-coherent environment. And then a final question is how do we expose the, the capacity tier of shared memory um, to the applications that are, that are going to use it? We've chosen to do that through a file system API, um, and in particular, you know, we expose it in what we call you know, books or shelves. So there's a, a librarian that will coordinate the access to that shared memory pool, um, and then the librarian file system is the, the file system that's, uh, that's exposed to users in order to be able to take that shared memory and then to map it directly into their address space uh, and, and to be able to, to use it. And all of these components that are shown here in orange have been open sourced um, and they provide a platform for, for others to be able to explore uh, the, the modifications that one would need to make in order to, to, to do memory driven computing application development on top. In the space of rethinking abstractions, and we have one example is, is the space jump work that was published at ASPLUS uh, last year. And the basic idea here is that Right now, a traditional world has a one-to-one -one correspondence between a process and its virtual address space. What if we broke that apart and made an address space a first-class citizen? This would mean that address spaces could outlive the processes that create them. They could even be shared between different processes to do communication. Um, because we're in a world where the, the amount of memory is just so large that we can't even address it with the, the number of physical address bits that we have in processors, this, this abstraction would allow us to actually address 
multiple, uh, you know, multiple windows in order to be able to, uh, you know, to, to see all of the memory that, that we have in the system. Um, it would also allow us to do interesting uh, things with versioning or checkpointing. We could actually create a snapshot of an application and then come back to it later on if we wanted to go back in time to a particular point in time. Uh, and so uh, my colleagues uh, working with various universities, uh, University of Illinois, ETH Zurich, and Georgia Tech, um, have, have actually implemented this in, uh, in a number of different operating systems, Barrelfish, uh, Linux, as well as BSD, and shown that it provides tr tremendous benefits for doing uh, communication as well as, uh, as well as managing the large address space that's presented by memory-driven computing. In terms of the, the data management and programming frameworks, um, we have a number of different things that we've been looking at here. Uh, and so I'll, tell, I'll tell you a little bit more about, um, about that next. So in the, in the database space, so again, familiar APIs, and let's adapt them to this environment. Um, what we're seeing is you know, traditional online transaction processing workloads really spend a lot of their time managing the fact that storage is slow. There's a buffer manager that will manage moving data back and forth from the slow storage device. You know, the, the ability to do transaction commits is limited by the speed of the, the logging devices and so on. And so, you know, a study that, that was done about 10 years ago found that only about 10% of the actual time was spent doing the work of the transaction processing. There's an opportunity, obviously, in this new, uh, new architecture to really rethink this and to get closer to that, that theoretical uh, performance possibility. And so work that one of my colleagues did uh, looks at how do we build a database engine, or really the kind of the storage engine part of that, uh, to take advantage of these architectures that have a large amount of memory large amount of persistent memory as well as a large number of cores associated with it. So this is a, an open source from scratch database engine um, that really tries to remove all of the, the serialization and synchronization bottlenecks um, to provide very fast performance. Um, and it provides full ACID properties as well as you know, serializability. Um, but it's nice because it's a library that you can embed in an application. So an application can have in-memory transactions um, and be able to, to achieve that without necessarily having to go through a really thick software stack. And the combination of different techniques that are being used there really allow us to, to see orders of magnitude better performance than other in-memory database applications. Um, and this, again, has been uh, published in SIGMOD uh, a couple of years ago, as well as open sourced um, to the community. It's also been used as an embedded database in the context of a graph processing uh, application. And that was work that was published earlier this year at the CIDR conference. Kind of the elephant in the room here is, do, do we need separate representations of data on storage versus in memory? Because right today, we have a serialized representation on disk and an in memory representation that we use when we're in memory. Wouldn't it be great if we could just write programs with persistent data structures? And so the idea would be that these you know, in-memory objects would be durable. They would outlive the process that created them, outlive you know, uh, in, in the event of, a, of an OS reboot. In principle, this is a really great idea. Uh, but in practice, it works out to be much harder than you might think because, the, you know, just because the data has been persisted doesn't necessarily mean that it's been persisted in a way that allows the application to recover after a failure. So let's see what I mean by that. Let's take a simple example of, you know, of a banking transaction uh, where we have two, two bank accounts. We're trying to transfer data back and forth between them. And so some pseudocode is shown here for that. Let's imagine that the account data structure is, is declared persistently in memory. Uh, if I crashed in the middle of doing the transfer, I think most of us would agree that there wouldn't necessarily be a consistent view of the account balances on, on the storage medium um, when, when the, the system came back up. But what if, I, what if I crashed and my system has now locked up so I am not able to do the rest of my animation? There we go. All right, so what if I crashed after the transaction completed? How many people believe that the, the persistent state would be correctly reflect either the transfer had been completed or the transfer had not been started? Okay, have a handful of folks that think that. You would hope that that would be the case, but unfortunately, the, the update that has been done might still get stuck in the processor's volatile cache. And it, you know, even though the, the, the processor thinks that it's completed the transfer, that the data hasn't actually been persisted yet. So because the way that things are evicted from the cache means that you know, we, might not, we might only see a portion of this transfer and not all of it. So if we died in the middle of this, the transfer might not have actually completed from the perspective of the, the persistent storage layer. 
So because of this you know, sort of boundary between the volatile part of our state and the, the persistent part of our state, um, there's this opportunity for crashes to cause corruption, which will prevent applications from being able to recover after the crash. Now, programmers could, could make this not a problem by explicitly logging all of the data that they're going to update, but I don't know about you, but I, I wouldn't want to have to write code like this that actually explicitly you know, creates an undo record and then, uh, you know, and then logs all of the, the updates that I'm making. This is going to be error prone and, and, and it's hard to believe that people are going to get it right. So some of the work that we've been doing looks at more automated ways of actually achieving that. Um, and in particular, a system called Atlas that was published a few years ago, basically works for multi-threaded applications where we try, we look at the, the lock acquisitions and releases to delineate where there are critical sections. And we understand that those are, those are the important sections where data needs to be persisted in an atomic fashion. So we either need to make it look like the atomic section happened or it didn't happen. Um, and so the idea here is to augment the compiler to instrument uh, the application so that calls can be made to a logging library that will be, will do the logging operations under the covers um, and, and the application programmer won't have to worry about it. Um, and so the programmer just writes the ordinary multi-threaded code um, and then the, the rest of the infrastructure will take care of making sure that any updates that they make during these critical sections are persisted in, an, in a crash consistent fashion. And this system was published at Uppsala um, and the, the code has been open sourced in case people are taking a, interested in taking a look. We've looked more recently at another approach to achieving this same fault tolerant programming model. Uh, again, looking at the, the lock based uh, programs um, and the critical sections that they delineate, but instead um, using, using another idea, borrowing it from the earlier work um, in, uh, in, the, in the systems community. Um, if you have a, a multi-threaded application, um, the dthreads project from a couple of years ago uh, looked at actually turning each of the threads in that computation into its own process. And so what we are using this process for is to provide a private address space. So each of the different threads of execution will have its own private address space to make any, any local updates. And then those updates are only ever shared with the rest of the, the threads in the system um, once the, 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 the originating process has actually exited its critical section. And so in doing so, we get rid of the need to do this fine grain logging that Atlas looked at um, and to be able to opens us up to the possibility of doing coarser grain logging operations. And so what we find is that that allows us to achieve better, better performance than, uh, than this fine-grained approach. And this was work that appeared at Eurasis uh, just a few weeks ago. So a final uh, so entry into this space is really looking at, uh, at the idea of managed data structures. Um, and so this is not strictly related to you know, multi-threaded uh, lock-based programs, but really a more general programming model um, where the programmer writes data structures uh, and allocates data structures um, in a managed space uh, with the idea that then applications can use references to these data structures to directly access this, access the data structure through load and store operations. They can also share the data between processes, um, whether that's a process written in the same language or even potentially a different language, um, through references uh, back and forth. Uh, and, and there are also some interesting uh, constructs that have been uh, implemented in this system that allow you to actually have different kinds of, of visibility models or, or, or consistency models between different uh, sharing uh, entities. So what we're looking at here is, you know, different lines here represent different uh, execution threads, essentially. So the parent would be the, the straight line across the slide, um, but then a child, you know, could be either uh, sort of trying, if we look at the bottom, basically uh, a snapshot could be, could be generated for a particular child if the child didn't want to see any of the updates that the parent was making. Um, and so in doing so, it's possible to isolate the child from the, those updates. Um, you might want to do this for purposes of doing uh, data analytics uh, kind of, of, of operations for business intelligence uh, kinds of op applications. So that's one model. You could also imagine that that you know, a child might be doing its own updates and that the parent might want to know about those. Um, so, if, so long as the, as the child chooses to then share the results of the computation, it's possible to actually keep those, you know, keep those two threads um, within, uh, within a closer synchrony. Um, and so either of these different kinds of sharing models is possible through this managed data structures library.
Um, and because the, the managed data structures really allows you to eliminate the, the file system, the database, and, and whatnot, you really are, have an opportunity to improve the performance of the overall system uh, because there are fewer software layers to go through. Similarly, there's a potential for having more reliable software just because the lines of code that you don't write can't be wrong. And this is a project that's been open sourced and is available for download as well. All told, we've, you know, we've done work in a, a bunch of different parts of the space, including uh, emulation and simulation tools, which I haven't talked about. Um, and we've open sourced many of these different tools, um, the ones that are shown here in orange. Um, and I would encourage you to, you know, to take a look um, because our, our, you know, we really feel like we've scratched the surface here um, and you know, we want to enable the, the community to continue this exploration of this memory-driven computing space. Okay, finally, uh, the last section of the talk really thinks about what are some open challenges? You know, again, as I said, I feel like we've scratched the surface and there are some interesting you know, opportunities that, that still exist uh, and we, we'd love to figure out uh, what, what are the next steps there. So in particular, if, if fabric attached memory is supposed to be blurring the line between memory and storage, and it needs to take the role of storage that, that storage has traditionally played, you know, Mem then, then the fabric attached memory really does need to be able to safely persist the, the data. Um, and so what that means is that you know, the data needs to be persisted reliably in the face of failures, securely in the face of various exploits. It also needs to be done in a cost-effective manner and it needs to be done using an access API that actually makes sense for the underlying technology. And so I think there's some interesting challenges in, in all these different areas. In terms of storing data reliably and, and securely and cost effectively, the problem here really is that if, if non-volatile memory is the new storage, then that means that we need to be able to survive failures of the non-volatile memory media, as well as any sort of, of, the, of the, the fabric uh, that, that comes between the, the, the processing elements and the, and the non-volatile memory. Similarly, persistent data could be stolen if the fabric attached memory were taken away. And so, the storage community in general has, has had decades of thinking about these kinds of problems and has developed a number of, of interesting solutions in the space for things like replication, erasure codes, you know, compression, encryption, um, as well as where leveling devices, deduplication, and dealing with snapshots and whatnot. So it's really time for, for the storage community to think about how we could apply that, that knowledge and that understanding to this new environment. And so the, the new challenges here, though, are that rather than operating at storage speeds, we need to be able to operate orders of magnitude faster at memory speeds. Um, we also need <clears throat> uh, to, to take into consideration the fact that you know, if our goal is to really provide direct access to these, to these data structures, um, having some of these mitigation techniques uh, in the way is going to complicate that direct access because they change the representation of the data. Um, and then finally, non-volatile memory um, is a scarcer resource than colder storage tiers, and so we need to think about what's a space-efficient representation. So some potential solutions here. Obviously, software uh, could be used for any of these, uh, any of these possible uh, challenges, but there's going to be then a trade-off between the flexibility that software provides and the performance that it provides. We might not be able to take full advantage of these new technologies. So, we need to think of combined hardware, software kinds of, of techniques. Um, and in particular, you know, there are lots of open questions about how memory side hardware acceleration should actually be brought to bear on this problem. What kinds of functions should be used? Um, where should they be implemented in the memory system? Um, and then what's the right combination of hardware and software? Also questions around you know, wear leveling for, for fabric attached non-volatile memory um, that are perhaps a little bit different than wear leveling for traditional non-fabric-attached non, non non-volatile memory. And in particular, because we want to use the, the shared memory to coordinate, um, there's this uh, you know, fabric-attached memory is a natural place to store that coordination state that's going to be updated again and again and again. So they're you know, potentially um, sort of exacerbating the, the device wear issues in this shared memory environment that we wouldn't necessarily see um, in a in a non-shared environment. So you know, what is the right combination between software techniques like changing our algorithm versus, uh, versus hardware techniques for, for dealing with wear leveling? And then finally, in order to be able to survive failures, we need to understand what's gone wrong. And so the, the, the storage community has the smart uh, APIs and standards that are being used to, to report kinds of problems, but it's an open question as to what the, the analog is here in this, in this memory-driven computing space. 
Our, our storage technologies um, really beg the question, what is the most cost-effective solution here? It's hard to believe that, you know, that load store memory will be the most cost-effective tier for the forever tier of, of an HPC kind of an application. Um, and so we need to think about how we can effectively use all of the different tiers. And so, you know, just some idea of some potential uses from a data residence perspective. You know, it's easy to imagine that the, 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 the volatile memory is being used for scratch or ephemeral data structures, whereas non-volatile memory is used for the, the first line of persistence of data structures, and it's resilient to failures, hopefully, if we can solve the problems on the previous slide. And then finally, the more durable or long-term storage would, needs would be handled by, by SSDs and, and uh, disks and tape and cloud-based storage and so on and other, other tiers of, of storage. But the question then is, you know, how do we actually manage this multi-tier hierarchy um, to ensure that the data is in the right tier at the right time? So we heard some interesting, uh, interesting uh, hi hierarchical storage management talks yesterday afternoon. So how can those ideas be applied to this me more memory-centric kind of, of, of hierarchy? And then a final question is around, you know, what's the appropriate memory, what's the appropriate API for the technology? Um, and I think we would all agree that if the latencies are, are sufficiently low, so you know, under 100 or even small, small hundreds of, of nanoseconds, we will want to be doing loads and stores to very small uh, sort of granularity of, uh, you know, of, of data uh, items. Um, but if we, can't, uh, if we can't necessarily ensure that the latencies will be that low, then it makes more sense to amortize the cost of doing those accesses um, you know, with more of an I.O.-based API. Um, and there's intentionally an overlap there because there is this you know, gray area in between those two that's you know, in, the, in the space of you know, a couple of microseconds or even a couple hundred uh, nanoseconds where, where the, the right choice really depends probably more on the needs of the application um, and whether it's more of a bandwidth-oriented application or more of a latency oriented application. There are all sorts of questions about, about figuring out what, uh, what the right set of APIs is here. I'm going to skip over this in the interest of time, um, but there are interesting questions around you know, adapting access to control to those finer grained um, accesses and supporting new failure models in this space. So just to wrap up, um, we've done a fair bit of work in this space and we've tried to publish the work that we've done both in conferences as well as tech reports and so I'm sure these slides will be posted so there's a, a long list of publications that you're interested if you're interested you can take a closer look at some of the work that we've done in this space. Um, similarly, uh, we've open sourced a number of the, the projects that we've worked on from the operating system all the way up through the, the data management and, and application layers um, and, and open sourced the, the work that we've done there. This is work that's been done by a large group of people across Hewlett Packard Labs, as well as some of the business units at, at Hewlett Packard Enterprise. And so too many names to fit on one slide, but I just wanted to acknowledge the work of, of the folks whose work has appeared in the talk. So just to wrap up, memory-driven computing is a new architecture that brings together fast, persistent memory, uh, fast memory-based uh, uh, interconnects, as well as task-specific processing, and a new re uh, storage, uh, storage stack and, and memory management stack uh, in order to solve the problems that face us today when we try and do data-intensive kinds of processing uh, applications. Um, there are lots of opportunities here. You know, we really are just scratching the surface um, of, of the, the opportunities that, that we can potentially take advantage of. But hopefully, I've given you a, a feel for some of the things that are possible um, and piqued your interest, and so you'll, you'll want to think about how you might exploit memory-driven computing for the work that you're doing. So with that, I'll conclude and take questions. Great. Thanks, thanks Kimberly. Uh, if you have a question, do you want to uh, come up to the mic, please? I just had a question about how this will be managed analogously to, you know, a big server or something of today, because you have this shared memory and there's kind of no OS layer that's managing the memory itself. You're kind of trusting all the SOCs to be good citizens and not step on each other. How does that work practically? I mean, if I have a rogue process in one SOC, how do I keep it from you know, you know, looking at other people's memory, changing other people's mm -hmm. memory, and that sort of thing. Yeah, so, so those are some of the things that I didn't necessarily have very much of a chance to talk about. Um, so we believe that the primary actors in this environment are the nodes and their, their operating systems, but there are going to be some, you know, cluster-wide, if you will, services. So things like the librarian, which will help those, help to coordinate the memory allocations, at least at a very coarse granularity, um, you know, to the, the different nodes and to coordinate the sharing. 
There's also support in the, the fabric itself, actually, for, you know, for providing um, exclusive access you know, or shared access to various regions of memory, and that can be implemented in the, the fabric bridges as well as on the, on the endpoints and potentially even in the memory system, at, in memory, in the media itself. Um, we're also exploring uh, different kinds of access control that might be used to enforce uh, you know, sort of very fine-grained access control. So in particular, looking at things like hardware-based capabilities um, and, and looking at, you know, essentially, you've got a, a special pointer that, that if you have the appropriate access rights, you will be given the opportunity to dereference that pointer and to access the memory that's there. You can potentially share that. There are some interesting you know, research questions around how to manage the revocation of those properties you know, very easily. And so we've got some ideas for how you can translate some of the stuff that's been going on on the single node system into a you know, more of a rack scale uh, kind of an environment but there are definitely you know it's, it's not just the operating system that's responsible for this it's it's a coordination between the operating systems and some of these you know these management services as well as maybe even the hardware itself um, that's a part answer to your question, you know, another part answer to your question is that there are um, algorithmic techniques that we can use for doing the coordination. So uh, the programming language community has been doing a lot of work in lock-free programming techniques. Um, and so this notion of being able to use atomic operations um, and you know, careful data structure uh, definition as well as access to always have maintain a data structure in a consistent fashion. So even if a process goes away, then you know it can come back and actually um, have you know, have the data structure not be impacted um, for for the other other users of that data structure. So I think there's a kind of a whole host of, of different options for you know for being able to you know to explore different solutions to the problem. <clears throat> Maybe your answer is going to be the same for this, but I mean, there's a whole host of things. I mean, one thing about treating it as memory is people expect memory to be volatile, right? Mm -hmm. So you've talked about going to great lengths to make sure it persists, but there's also occasions when you have to make it go away. So if a node crashes, a user's running on it, you expect that that memory will go away, right? So you also need the ability to track that as well as capacity. You know, it's big, but it is a finite resource, and when you have multiple people using it, you know, you need the equivalent of how do you find out how much space is available, how do you maybe enforce quotas, things like that on it. So is that all kind of covered through these access control mechanisms? That I don't know that the, the access control mechanism would necessarily help you deal with the, the quota kind of a situation. Um, you know, in terms of just, be, just because the memory has the property to be able to persist data doesn't mean you have to use it. So you could conceivably, you know, give a region of memory and then say that, you know, this will be volatile, you know, whenever this, this you know, node operating system reboots itself, we will zero out this portion of the memory. You will not be able to assume that it, it, it has persisted. And I think, you know, it's been interesting talking with some customers. There are some folks that would prefer to use the, the non-volatile memory technologies for their density properties, but to treat them as, as volatile. And so I think there are definitely people that are interested in that just because of the, the improved density that's possible there. Um, let's see, I think there was another part of your question that I have not yet no, talked about, but I don't remember what it was. No, I think those are the two things, but again, if you start now needing to erase it, now you hit the wear leveling challenges as well. So. Potentially, you know, and so, you know, depending on how you choose to, you know, to do those allocations, you could potentially then remap someone to a new, new part of the address space, you know, if you didn't want to pay the cost of actually doing the, you know, sort of the zeroing or the erasing, um, you know, in, as, as the, the node is rebooting itself. So I think that there, you know, there are opportunities for, for Having the, the, the wear leveling kinds of techniques, you know, balance with the, you know, sort of the maintaining the, the, the data as, or maintaining the memory as, as a volatile resource if that's the way that you choose to handle it. Okay, one more question, John. So how do you assure the uh, repeatability of time to execution, time to solution for an individual given problem with volatile memory do you the feel like you have that today? Are, the latencies are relatively assured. With non-volatile memory, you have garbage collection. With SSDs, you have wear leveling. You have cells go bad with disk drives. So as you go down the hierarchy of this tiered storage you're talking about, you have a bunch of different devices that act in different ways. And as one example, if you're using SSDs and you're tiering, uh, because my reference to SSDs could potentially be uh, affected by someone's previous application run. The mm -hmm. same might be true with non-volatile memory if the way, way wear leveling works, I don't know. So how do you assure from one point to another the viability of time to solution? So if last week it took me 300 seconds to get a solution to a problem and I run relatively the same problem today, how do I know that I've got, you know, that it'll run in 300 seconds, not run in 1200 as mm -hmm. an example? Mm 
Well, I think, I mean, I think a lot of these challenges exist in today's systems, even if you're talking about just a memory-based system, because, you know, large, you know, large multiprocessors that have shared memory, you know, have NUMA effects associated with them. And so, um, you know, I think it's not just about SSDs and disks, you know, because they certainly have these, you know, these non-uniform properties based on the, the access patterns and the, the other workloads and the potential for interference there. Um, you know, so some of the same kinds of techniques that we use in NUMA world, in, in the NUMA world, I think could potentially be applied here. So it's certainly, you know, if, if the concern is about the locality of memory references, you know, it's certainly possible to allocate memory that might be slightly closer to where the, the computation will run um, than, than, you know, really, really far away. I, I do believe, though, that, you know, the fabric attached memory, there will be close to uniform, you know, memory latency across that fabric. Um, but if, the, if there is a concern, then one could explicitly manage the locality of those allocations. Um, and I think, you know, there, there is always, I think, an issue in terms of, uh, you know, of this at, at many different levels of the storage hierarchy. Um, what's, what's helpful about managing the lower levels of the storage hierarchy is that you're not thinking so much about, you know, about the um, having to have very, very fast response time if, if you're using them primarily to store cold data. Hopefully, you would know something about the access patterns and to be able to, you know, sort of bring in the data that you need to be able to use into the, the faster storage tiers in order to be able to have that faster access. Um, and so if you know that about your workload, as I think many HPC applications do, then you would be able to protect yourself or insulate yourself against some of the, uh, you know, the issues that come up in the, in the, in the disk world as well as in the SSD world. So Thank that's you. at least a partial answer to your question. We can talk more offline. Okay, great. Um, we've got to move on, but uh, again, let's thank our speaker. It was a great talk and a great discussion. Thank you.